perhaps says 2.55, so I guess it's time to get started. Um, right, so my name is Tomer Gabel. Uh, I work for an Israeli company called Wix. Uh, and I'm going to be talking a lot about the company, but not about what we do, but rather uh, the sort of challenges that I think can apply to pretty much any uh, growing organization and how we're trying to tackle them. So the title of the talk is Onboarding at Scale, um, or a different title, maybe a better one, is Onboarding as an Engineering Problem, right? Because I'm an engineer, usually I do technical talks. This time uh, we're trying to tackle an organizational problem, but we're trying to apply kind of basic engineering principles to, to how we uh, try to solve it. So uh, if there are at any point during the talk, if there are any questions, concerns, if you want to, uh, you know, throw stuff at me, that's all good. Um, and at the end of the talk, please do not forget, uh, depending on how much you hated it, uh, put the right uh, kind of color in the box. So, a bit of context. Wix is a web publishing platform, right? Our, our product is essentially a what you see is what you get web editor. You build your site, you click on publish, and your site is up. And you don't have to know like anything technical. You don't need to know HTML or CSS or DNS or any of that stuff. You just click a button and it's there. And that's all I'm gonna say about the product. Uh, more crucially, we have a, a distributed R&D team. We have three offices, uh, one in Tel Aviv, one in Ukraine in uh, Dnipropetrovsk, which I'm horribly pronouncing, and one in Vilnius, Lithuania, which is actually like about 15 minute walk uh, away from this place. Uh, more importantly, we are not working. Okay, we're growing rapidly. So uh, when I joined the company just over two years ago, we had something along the lines of 120 engineers in total. Uh, two years and you know a couple of months later, we're at 350 engineers and we're growing. And more importantly, we're uh, you know we're planning on on doubling that size in the next couple of years, maybe even less. So we're growing very, very, very aggressively. And as you might, might imagine, that causes quite a few problems for the organization. So the title of the talk, the alternate title, is Onboarding as an Engineering Problem. So let's consider what engineering is, right? You have a problem statement. You start off with a problem you're trying to solve. You do some research. You propose solutions. You implement solutions. You do a postmortem. And then you go back to the beginning, right? You find the next set of problems, hopefully smaller problems or optimization problems, you solve those. So that's sort of what we're going to do to, uh, you know, to try and tackle the engineering uh, issue that we had with onboarding new engineers. So the problem statement is actually really, really easy, right? The fundamental premise of this talk is scaling up your organization, your engineering organization is really, really hard, especially if you're trying to do that with a whole bunch of people in a very short span of time while you're still developing your products and hopefully making money off of them. So we started off with a bit of research, right? We try to figure out what is it that makes our company tick and how can we, how can we try and improve that. Uh, one word about the way the company is structured. So we, uh, what was it, I think four years ago, three years ago, uh, we adopted a variant of the Spotify model of, uh, what is it they call it? I think it's guilds and something, can't recall. Uh, I've heard different names for it. Uh, with us, it's either guilds and gangs or more commonly guilds and companies. So it's basically a variant and a theme on a matrix-based organization. We have companies that are basically uh, teams developing specific products, and then we have guilds that are sort of the overarching uh, groups responsible for you know, a certain horizontal, horizontal space of technical expertise. Uh, now, the difference between this and a pure matrix organization is that uh, people grow up within the guild and are assigned to companies. And from that point on until they are, you know, until either the company is defunct, the product is deprecated, or it's done, um, they are assigned to that, uh, to that specific company. They are managed by the company lead, uh, who is often either a technical manager or a product manager. And then at some point they get uh, reclaimed back into the pool of available engineers for that guild. So certain guilds that we might have uh, are things like the backend guild or the server guild. Uh, we have a client guild. We have actually a few of them, a product guild, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the reason this is interesting is because the first thing we wanted to do as part of the research on why scaling up is hard is identify who our customers are and what sort of problems they're having. So this is kind of product management 101. So our customers are three guilds within Wix. We have our server guild. Um, you know, 
nowadays it comprises some, I think, probably like 150 engineers. Uh, we write our uh, backend systems mostly in Scala. We have the usual that you might expect, continuous delivery, TDD, um, uh, microservices, et cetera, et cetera. We have our React guild and our Angular guild. Those are our two kind of primary front-end guilds. Now, the structure of the company is not the big deal. What is the big deal is what makes it hard for them to grow? What makes it hard for us to get new engineers and get them productive as fast as humanly possible? So we started asking questions, right? We, we approached our kind of guild masters or guild leads, uh, if you will, uh, all three of them. We had a round of discussions try to figure out what is it that is challenging for each of these guilds. And we found the following. So for our server, Scala Guild, if you will, we have three challenges. One is onboarding. And onboarding is a, is a challenge because of two fundamental reasons. The first is there's a pretty high barrier of entry to writing software uh, on the server side in general and at Wix scale specifically. We operate at a very high scale. We operate at a very high SLA level. Uh, you know, certain of our systems typically need to have you know, something approaching five nines of availability, which is never easy uh, at a pretty big scale. We have, what is it, 75 million uh, registered users, lots of sites. Uh, we serve those sites. We need to operate everything uh, sufficiently, uh, you know, sufficient in a sufficiently stable manner for our customers to actually keep on paying us or we'll go out of business. So there's a very high barrier of entry to how you actually do software engineering on the server side under these conditions. Second is the obvious issue of high overhead, right? You have a new engineer coming into the team. That in itself is good enough a reason for the team to lose, you know, within, within the span of dozens of percentages of productivity over a period of time until that new engineer becomes productive within that specific team. Um, is this not obvious to everyone? Like, does anyone want to challenge this? So the question was, are those guilds multinational? The answer is yes. We have both server and front-end developers in each of these R&D centers, including in, in Vilnius. Uh, the other challenge that we had on the server guild is around doctrine. doctrine. So by doctrine, I mean how we actually do our software development. It's not about the tech stack. It's more about the, the kind of things that you need to keep in mind as a software developer. So in terms of methodologies, we're heavily vested in TDD. Uh, we're heavily vested in continuous delivery. Uh, those things, like those aspects of software development, actually require a certain mindset from our engineers that is not necessarily obvious to, it, to new people coming into the company. If you're you know, used to working at a, at a more traditional enterprise where you basically build your software, you commit it, and then there, there are you know, traditional release cycles and that sort of thing, you're not used to the sort of flexibility, accountability, and uh, you know, the, the, the ramifications and how you actually write your code that you would get from an organization running continuous delivery. So that was a big problem for us. Also, uh, operational awareness. Like I said, we operate at very high SLAs. That means that code needs to be written defensively. It needs to have, you know, the right set of instrumentation uh, built in, metrics, logging, all the usual stuff. Uh, that shouldn't come as any surprise, but we needed to teach people coming into the company a lot of these things from scratch. The third problem, bandwidth, right? We were growing very rapidly to begin with, so our teams are busy. They're busy writing software. They're busy building products, making more money for the company. They're overloaded, overloaded to begin with, right? Everyone is hopefully operating at capacity, and as soon as you add someone new to the mix that people around have to teach, their productivity dwindles, right? They can't produce as much stuff as they used to because they're too busy teaching someone else how to do that. So that's, that's also a big problem. For other guilds, uh, the challenges look pretty familiar or almost familiar. So with the React guild, one of our front-end guilds, we had basically the same issue with onboarding. Uh, it's not quite as difficult as it is with the server guild because there isn't there isn't as much of a technical, like technological stack as you typically get in a server side, uh, server side organization. Still, it's a very hard problem, and it basically halted our velocity for a while. 
Uh, other challenges include recruiting. Recruiting is always a challenge for everyone involved uh, with our uh, front end guild specifically. It screwed us over, right? We needed to be able to recruit people in a sustainable, manageable way. We just couldn't do that. Uh, a different, slightly different challenge for our front end guilds is diversity. Um, this particular guild actually handles a lot of very, very different products, and there is a very limited set of um, kind of overlap between the tech stacks of each of these product groups, right? They all use React.js, fine. They all build on JavaScript or ECMAScript 6 or TypeScript, whatever, fine. That's about the, the, the breadth of um, shared, uh, shared technical know-how between these groups. So this was also a big problem for us. The Angular Guild, once again, two classic problems, onboarding and recruiting, same set of problems. So there is a recurring theme here, right? It's obvious that we have some set of shared problems among all of our groups and some sort of problems that are unique to each group. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to be talking about onboarding specifically because that is something that will hopefully fit in 15 minutes. Um, I'm not going to be talking about recruiting or any of that other stuff. That's you know, a good subject for a completely different talk. So we've done our research, and then we started uh, debating what the right set of solutions would be. So to start with, our uh, kind of primary solution to the problem would be to start a new internal division within Wix called Wix Academy, a company, if you will, who's charged with handling things like onboarding, recruiting, uh, training and retraining engineers, and a few other interesting things. Now, this is, a, this is a kind of a support organization, right? It doesn't produce products for outside the company, certainly not any of Wix's core products. But it is tasked with making sure that the rest of the company can proceed and generate as much product and as much business value as possible while, you know, getting more and more uh, highly qualified people uh, to increase their, uh, their velocity. Uh, we ended up designing three products. Those are on the screen. Uh, Kickstart is the one I won't be discussing because that has to do with recruiting. The other two products I'm going to be discussing in some amount of detail. And that, those products are called the Training Kit and the Crash Course. And in practice, what we did was design and uh, propose a new onboarding pipeline for the company. So the way this works is thus. This is the timeline for a new engineer coming into the company in either of those three guilds. So on day one, you, you have the usual stuff, right? Someone coming into the company on day one, they have to go make the rounds, meet their managers, uh, do some of the admin stuff, sign papers, get equipment, HR, all of that usual stuff. So that, that hasn't changed one iota. But more importantly, for the next couple of weeks, uh, the plan was to have up to two weeks of kind of playing catch up. Right, trying to figure out uh, how we can leverage the first week or two to get people as, I hate this word, but I'm going to use it anyway, as aligned to the way we uh, do software development in Wix as possible. By which I mean uh, learning technologies that they may not be familiar with. So our server group uses Scala. Scala is not a Wix-specific technology. You know, it's our language of choice in the back end, but it's not specific to Wix. So the idea is to use up those two weeks to get to know the team, get to know the product, product a little bit, but most crucially, get as much of the, of the groundwork out of the way. Get as much non-WIC specific learning as possible uh, with minimal impact to the team. And I'm gonna talk a lot about how we're, we were trying to do that. Uh, within two months, the idea is to onboard people to the point where they have end-to-end -end production development experience at Wix. They have experienced the full, uh, the full stack of Wix technologies and tool chain, uh, the build system, the deployment system, the lifecycle management system, pretty much anything that, that is involved with getting stuff to production at Wix is supposed to be experienced within those two months to the point where people are comfortable uh, pretty much walking into any team, like joining any team at any point and knowing at least in the broad strokes how uh, their peers do their work with, once again, minimal disruption to the team. So the first product uh, we've developed is called the training kit. And the, training, the idea behind the training kit is uh, that people coming into Wix will spend up to two weeks 
learning as much as possible about the set of WIC non-WIC specific technologies that they can. So uh, in terms of who the customers are, we actually have three customers for this product. So this is one of our guild leads, uh, my favorite guy in the world. Um, the supreme leader of the backend guild would might want to get new people into the company and start onboarding them as early as possible. Because right now what oftentimes happens is that the span of time between someone joining the company and someone actually starting to learn about the company and the product and the engineering practices, you know, it might be an hour, but it might be a week depending on what's going on within that specific team. Okay, if there's a, you know, a production crunch or we're gearing up towards the Super Bowl or whatever it is that we do, uh, people might just be too busy. Right, so the idea is to shorten that amount of time to the very minimum possible. Second, reduce overhead, right? Onboarding takes a toll on the team. It takes a toll on the people involved in teaching any new engineer what they need to know in order to get their job done effectively. Third, and this is sort of a, a, a nice artifact, hold on a sec. This is sort of a nice artifact. We also wanna have quality reference material because a lot of times, you know, even, even people who had been at Twix for a year or two years, uh, they move projects, they move teams, suddenly they have to learn a whole bunch of new stuff from scratch. So if I'm moving from the front end to the back end, or between two back end teams, one is doing event sourcing, one is using a more traditional relational model, I have things that I need to learn, and this takes a toll on my team. So if we have quality reference material for uh, you know, any, anything that is not necessarily specific to Wix or anything that doesn't change very rapidly, that's a huge bonus. Yes, there was a question. So the question was, do we also consider the social aspects? We do up to a point, and I'm going to go into that as we, as we proceed. Right, so this is one customer for the training kit. Another customer is the team lead, right? I'm running a team. So what, what do I want out of a new person joining the team? So I want to simplify the training for the new engineers coming into my team as much as possible. I want to make it simple for them to learn, simple for me and my team to teach them. Uh, I want to minimize disruption to my team. So my team is busy, right? Everyone is working at capacity typically, hopefully, right? On a well-managed team, people do not have spare time uh, within you know, the, the span of working hours. Uh, so we want to minimize how much work they actually have to do and how much incidental, uh, incidental disruption is caused by having a new engineer coming onto the team. Uh, and third, also, I want to have quality reference materials because someone coming into my team, if I want to teach them how to do event sourcing in CQRS, you know, I don't necessarily want to have to do that over and over again over the span of uh, the project's lifetime. I want to have something that I can just give them a URL, say, go do this, go read this, and be done with it as much as possible. Yes? So is that the question is, isn't, isn't the fact that we want to have the reference material, uh, I'm sorry, I'm repeating for the camera. Um, it isn't the fact that we want to have this reference material not indicative of the fact that, correct me if I misunderstood, basically we're setting the wrong bar when we hire people for that team. So what often happens is, first of all, I don't think so because you know, w we use a lot of different techniques, a lot of, uh, a lot of different technologies. If you, have some, some, um, you know, if you have a smart applicant to your company, you don't want to say no to them just because they haven't used Scala before. Right, because you can't hire Scala developers because there just aren't that many of them. Right, so that's one concern. The other concern is people move between teams. Right, so that, that's not really the, the, the point here. Uh, the third customer is actually the new hire. Right? As a new hire, I join a new team. I want to be able to understand the technology stack. I want to know what the hell is going on in the team I, I just joined. I want to be productive as quickly as possible and I want to basically not be a pest, right? I don't want to bother the people around me, the, the people on the team that I just joined over and over again with stupid questions. The questions may not be stupid, but they certainly feel that way coming into a new team, right? If I'm going to be joining a new team working in Scala, I'm going to have to ask a lot of stupid questions like, why does this not compile? What am I not getting here? 
right? We want to minimize that, both for the sake of uh, minimizing disruptions to the team, but also because it's really annoying to have to ask simple questions of busy people over and over again. So those are our goals. Uh, in terms of formal design goals for this product, for this training kit, uh, what we wanted was a kit of external, externally developed resources, right? We didn't want to have to develop our own training material because a lot of these things have been explained by people who are, you know, in some cases more qualified than we are to teach them. In other cases, they've put in a lot of work already developing these training materials. We don't want to have to, uh, you know, to redo their work. So we're trying to base uh, our, our training kit as much as possible on external resources. We wanted to be, uh, you know, we wanted people to be able to do guided self-learning. That is, we provide them with a kit of material for a certain subject and hopefully they can learn it all on their own without having to trouble anyone, without having to, once again, ask stupid questions. Uh, and we need it to be customizable because if a person coming onto the team already knows Scala but may not know event sourcing and CQRS, for instance, then it, it'd be a waste of time to teach them Scala, right? So it needs to be customizable per new engineer uh, coming into a given team or a given guild, as the case may be. So the way we, we set about developing this thing is basically a three-step development process with each guild. Uh, the first step is the kickoff. So what we did was uh, we met up with the guild lead, we being uh, the, the staff at the Wix Academy, met up with the guild lead. We validated that the assumptions that we made with regards to how the guild operates, what is, the, what is the set of technologies, the set of challenges, that we have a good, clear understanding uh, of what the, the set of challenges is. Uh, and then we had a, a chat. And after that chat, hopefully we've identified one, two, maybe three kind of key technical partners within that guild that we can talk to, right? The people who are most cognizant of what the tech stack is, what the challenges are, what, you know, what's easy to learn, what's hard to learn, what's important, what isn't, right? These are the people who, with whom we'll be working to actually develop the set of training material. Um, the second thing we did was meet each and every one of these key kind of technical partners and uh, set some scope expectations, right? We only have two weeks. We need to maximize up to two weeks, right? Because let's face it, coming onto a new team and spending more than two weeks just studying up on stuff is boring as hell. Right, you'd want to shoot yourself if you had to spend more than two weeks, and even two weeks is just sort of scraping the bare maximum that a person could withstand. So we had to set some scope expectations around that, and the outcome of that is a bucket list of desirable topics. And the last thing we did was review and prioritize these subjects. And the way we did this was very simple. This is Trello, you're probably familiar with it. We just had a few, a few lists, a card for each kind of subject. So you have here Git and Maven and Team City and New Relic and a whole bunch of stuff, uh, you know, a whole bunch of subjects that are not specific to Wix but are fundamental knowledge required to properly, uh, you know, to, to be a proper engineer in that guild. Once we had our bucket list, we went to the second step, which is actually developing uh, the training kit. So. Uh, at Wix, uh, what we do is one day out of five working days in every week is called a guild day where you basically stop working, assuming no production issues or crunch time or whatever, right? We're not without common sense, hopefully. But uh, you are under normal operating conditions. You're supposed to stop working on your specific product and instead work on guild-related stuff. So that might be infrastructure, that might be giving a technical talk or hearing a technical talk. It's everything that has to do with your profession as opposed to the product that you're working on. Right? So these are two kind of separate concerns. So we used up a bunch of guild days um, where we asked for volunteers from the guild. We collected them and hosted them in the Wix Academy building. There's a, a, a separate small building uh, dedicated to Wix Academy. Uh, we had them pick subjects from that Trello board and then basically spend a day doing internet searches and evaluating training material. So for instance, if I'm gonna come back to this example every so often because I'm com personally comfortable with it, uh, if we ask people to give us a recommendation about a set of training material for Scala, they might go searching for you know, online courses about Scala or uh, talks about Scala or blog posts or things that are you know, a, a collection of links, hopefully, 
uh, that provides a good kind of basic coverage of that particular subject. And then uh, the result of that was typically just a gist or an email or whatever with a list of links, a bit of an overview, some time estimations, just bare bones stuff, right? We didn't ask them to develop any material and we certainly did not ask them to uh, produce anything that is for public consumption. Just give us a recommendation of how you would, you know, what set of uh, links you would give to a new hire in order to learn a particular subject. The next thing we did was post-processing, right? We basically fed all of that, all of those recommendations through a professional training developer uh, or a content editor or whatever you want to call it. Uh, um, that person dealt with things like wording and formatting, but also just plain content editing, right? Making sure that the links work and things made sense um, and applying a consistent structure to every single subject because that the, the consistency thing is crucial. If you're gonna, gonna be studying 20 different subjects, you wanna have at least a common ground in terms of what you're gonna be getting for each one of these. Um, the, the structure is actually pretty dead simple, which is why I don't have a particular slide for it. It's basically uh, split up in three parts. You have learn, which is a set of links uh, that are, you know, that take you to training material uh, on the internet uh, that give you a good coverage of the subject. You have practice, which is once again either a set of links or a set of puzzles, whatever, uh, whatever is suitable for that particular subject. After which, uh, you know, if you've done all those uh, practice steps, hopefully you will have had some hands-on experience with the subject and can start to feel comfortable about it. And there's extras, which is extra bits and pieces, you know, tutorials, whatever, uh, whatever is useful, cheat sheets, forget, things like that. Um, so the idea here, here is not to rigorously teach people subjects because you can't learn Scala in a day, right? You certainly can't master Scala in a day. But the idea is to give people just enough information to when they do join their teams to ask the right questions, right? Not to have to ask simple questions like, what is this underscore doing here? But rather ask concrete questions that their team members, uh, that, that are not as disruptive to the team. If we've cut down the number of questions by 50%, we, we will have done our job properly. Finally, there is the question of feedback, right? There's always some, some feedback loop going on because you want to iterate over these products. So we solved it in three very, very specific and very simple ways. For each subject, we have a feedback link uh, that takes you to a, a Google form, uh, allowing you to feed us uh, feedback on a particular subject. And as a one-off, we spent a guild day asking volunteers to review the, the topics that we already had, just to make sure that the structure makes sense and that the, the quality is around uh, what they expected of this project. And we did some interviews, right? We took a few new hires that went through the program, interviewed them and a few team leads to try and ascertain whether or not that had been valuable uh, as an onboarding practice. Right, that's the training kit in a nutshell. So that's one product that, that we built and uh, hopefully, you know, we're, we're still going through the, the process of setting this up for the other guilds and new hires are still coming in and going through the process. It seems to be working for us so far, but we don't have a sufficient amount of data to actually, uh, you know, make a, uh, you know, run through a second iteration of it. We do have plans for what the product will look like when it's not based off of a crappy uh, GitHub and Markdown based thing, but uh, so far it seems to be working pretty well. Are there any questions about this? Yes. No, 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 these are all non-WIC specific things, right? These, this, this is just a, the kind of bare bone knowledge that you need to have to just find your way around the company without having anything to do with our specific product set or domain problems or, uh, you know, not even our, our internal tools are covered here. This is just to get you started with minimal disruption to the team. Okay, obviously we needed to complement this. And the way to complement this was something we ended up calling the crash course because the, the training kit doesn't teach you anything about how we do things at Wix, right? It just covers a bunch of ground that you would have had to cover regardless. So the crash course is the complement to the training kit. Uh, the idea is every two months, pre-scheduled, right? We take the, the people coming into those guilds over the course of the previous two months 
uh, and we place them in a three-week crash course about how we do business at Wix. And the end result of that is a working uh, minimal viable product, and by which I mean there is a concrete product that they need that, that we ask our participants to build. It's not a production grade product, it's not intended to be used in any production capacity, but it is intended to uh, fulfill three design goals, which are, it's, it's intended to give people end-to-end -end production development experience at Wix, right? So the idea is you build this product based on our selected tech stack using our internal tools, you go through development, through staging, through production, everything as you would with a, a bona fide Wix microservice. Uh, also, um, we have a mix of front-end and server developers building the, project, the, the building the project in conjunction. So they split up into groups that sort of mimic the team structure within, within Wix. This is very important because it gives people a good idea of how we actually work on proper production teams. And there's, uh, if you remember back to the, the challenges that we've had, one of them was doctrine, right? Teaching uh, methodologies and philosophies like TDD, continuous delivery, all that stuff. So there's a, a, a big focus on that. That's literally a design goal of this course. The challenges uh, that, that are inherent in, in such a system, in such a product, are that it's actually very expensive to produce. And I'm gonna get back to this point. But from a, a pure kind of return on investment perspective, if you have less than 10 to 12 engineers, it's just cost prohibitive. It, it costs too much to produce such a course. So if you can't kind of guarantee that you will have every two months 10 to 12 engineers coming into those, uh, to the relevant groups within Wix or within your company as the case may be, it's just cost prohibitive, don't do it. And that's actually been a problem for us. Uh, it requires a good mix of server and front-end devs. So if you tend to hire, uh, very, uh, your hiring is very heavily biased towards one of these groups, you're gonna be screwed, right? It's not gonna work because you're not gonna have enough people to put on the team. And finally, mentorship and preparation are critical to actually getting the design goals uh, met. So we started off with a planning phase. Uh, and the idea was to have a three-week course. And the first week is a ramp-up week. Right, it's heavily focused on doctrine, so it, it includes mostly, uh, mostly workshops and lectures around TDD, continuous delivery, just as examples, around our basic but you know, not obvious tech stacks. So the training kit might get you to the point where you're familiar with Scala syntax. This is intended to get you to the point where you're comfortable with Scala syntax. And there are also uh, domain-specific considerations. This is the crash courses where we actually bring the Wix specific aspects to bear on new hires, right? So at this point, we actually tackle things like internationalization and uh, SEO and other considerations that are critical to our business, but are not necessarily to the industry as a whole. And uh, in response to the question around the, the social aspects, so that one of the concern is, uh, concerns at this point is that people will get very easily bored and fed up. Just imagine going to a conference for five days speaking about things that are specific to your company. Sounds really, really depressing. So we needed to, to find some ways of coping with that. One of the ways was to interleave lectures and workshops. If you're, you know, if you're having like four hours of lectures on TypeScript and stuff, and then you have an actual workshop dealing with, say, security, uh, web security in, in, in particular, then you have a good mix, right? You don't get fed up and bored that easily. So that's a, that was a crucial uh, constraint on our planning process. For weeks two and three, um, weeks two and three are focused around actually developing that minimal viable product. So we uh, divvied up uh, our participants into teams, typically two to three people, depending on uh, how many participants and what kind of uh, server to front end mix we had uh, for any given iteration of the course. Um, we went through, two days of bootstrapping, which is basically we bring in highly qualified people from the guild to walk all the participants through the process of actually setting up a new full-blown product within Wix, right? So, it, uh, so it's everything from meeting the product manager for the first time, going over the product spec and asking the questions, to setting up a Git repository on GitHub, to uh, in case of a backend, uh, in, in case of the backend, setting up the, the right palms, or uh, in case of the front end, setting up Bower, 
and Yo uh, via Yeoman and all of that interesting stuff that I'm not really qualified to talk about because I don't actually do that. Uh, and the end result of those two days is what is called a walking skeleton, which is essentially a full-blown hello world project in production. Right? You get a server, you get a very, very stupid front end, and they talk to each other, and that's it. Right? Literally a hello world style product. But that gives enough context for people to actually start writing actual product features into, uh, into that project. The rest of those two weeks, you build a project. Right? Uh, you get uh, constant mentorship, by which I mean every second half of every day, uh, you get a, a very highly qualified person from every single guild coming in to answer questions, uh, to help you out, to help you figure out why your Scala doesn't compile or why your CSS ends up being wonky when you run through Firefox, all of that nice stuff. Uh, and it's also interspersed with additional lectures that have to do with our kind of uh, domain-specific infrastructure, such as our translation system or our uh, experiment system, which in itself is a pretty big and interesting topic. So if you're interested, there are uh, different lectures online about that. Um, uh, there's stuff around how we do lifecycle management for, for servers, right? Deployment is a big deal. There are a lot of different moving parts uh, that relate to deployment. There are feature flags. There's rolling deployment. There's the system that orchestrates all of that stuff. There's the build servers. So you need to, so you learn these things piecemeal as you progress through the project. And as with any uh, sufficiently complicated project, we ended up with a postmortem, right? The first iteration, the second iteration, we always do a postmortem and try and figure out what we did right, what we did wrong. So in terms of what we did right, uh, one of the, uh, one of the, very nice side effects that were not intended but ended up happening anyway was that um, with a lot of companies, including Wix in, in our kind of previous incarnations, there is a very distinct divide between front-end developers and back-end developers, server client developers, server groups, client groups. And they always, they're always at odds with each other. So one of the nice things that happened was having mixed teams uh, sit together and co-develop their own projects and also having them in such close proximity to other teams doing the same thing and having mentors from both guilds coming to help actually ended up uh, both generating uh, a much better understanding of how our client and server code bases integrate together but also uh, uh, our you know people coming out of that course actually felt that uh, compared to their previous positions in other companies uh, they were, they felt that there's a lot more kind of cooperation going on between the two groups. There's, you know, the, the wall kind of had been broken a little bit. So that was a very nice artifact of the way we, we ended up uh, designing the course. Uh, in terms of TDD, uh, which is one of the harder things I feel uh, to teach in any software company, certainly as you're actually building production code while you're trying to teach new hires how to do TDD, uh, this has been incredibly invaluable. So a lot of, uh, a lot of like we got out of 12 people, maybe seven, uh, seven comments to the extent that they didn't get TDD coming into the course and it gave them the hands-on experience that they actually needed to figure out what it means. You know, not become expert, experts at it by any means, but at least have a good grasp uh, of what TDD actually is and how to apply it. And finally, people wear. So uh, the very fact that we had consistent and constant mentoring, and then we also had different sessions where we'd bring, uh, you know, experienced people from the guilds to actually pair program with uh, applicants on the course, ended up being very, very beneficial and were highly praised. So, um, you know, there are two ancillary benefits of this. First is people came to their teams already a lot more familiar with how we do software development at Wix and what is expected of them and what they can expect of, the, of their, you know, the teams around them. Um, but also, and, and perhaps more crucially, uh, is the fact that they actually got to know several key personnel within the R&D organization. So when they joined their team, they didn't feel as disconnected. They already had people they're familiar with. They already had peers to 
you know, to go on venting sessions with if needed, but also they knew the right set of people that they could ask questions of whenever they get stuck or they needed help or review or whatever. That was very beneficial. And also, pretty much everyone um, ended up being, it's a superlative, but everyone was, was stupendously impressed with how much uh, we ended up investing in new personnel. Right? No one had experienced anything of the sort before, uh, neither have we, the, the people setting this up, but really uh, there is a very strong statement from the company when you say something like, okay, you're going to come into the company, we don't care about your productivity. We're going to spend three weeks just getting, just teaching you stuff, right? Improving your, your, um, improving your technical skills, teaching you new skills, and also making sure that you are comfortable within the organization. So that's a huge investment in time and money, and people really, really appreciate that. So that's cool. We did have a bunch of issues, such as this thing not working again. Right, so one issue that we had was tracking. Uh, so as it turns out, these are full-blown projects, so you need proper project management. Now, a lot of these things just tend to happen on the fly in teams that are experienced and, and small enough. You do, you do Scrum, you do daily stand-ups, you do whatever it is that you do, right? But you, the, the project tracking in of itself is not a problem for a full-blown production team because you typically start off just prototyping stuff and then you sort of evolve into that process. We had no time to evolve and we didn't put you know, those things in place, those tools, those communication channels in place right off the bat, and that became actually a big issue, uh, particularly for our mentoring staff. So we decided to go with uh, daily stand-up meetings with uh, the day's mentors and uh, the teams, and also mentors would communicate with one another over Stack, oh, Stack, over Slack. Um, it can be Slack or HipChat, whatever, right? The, the mechanism doesn't matter. What matters is that there are very clear goals to this communication. So it's, you know, progress updates, anything that's, that's problematic and needs to be looked at, uh, anything that was fundamentally broken with our design of the course or the, or the course project, uh, ish on the fly issues. It both gave uh, mentors a direct line of communication between each other and the staff, and it also documented a lot of problems that we could later refer to and solve. So that was very beneficial. Uh, in terms of administration, um, one of the concerns was that we needed to have a very clear and very visible schedule for the course, right? What is happening today? What are the lectures that are being given today? What is the expectation around project milestones that we're supposed to be heading today? All of these things needed to be answered at a glance at any given time by anyone involved in the project. Uh, we ended up using Google Calendar, actually. It was pretty straightforward, and I wish we'd have thought about it when we started off. Uh, also, we sort of assumed people would uh, very easily and quickly, organically uh, divvy up into, uh, into pairs whenever we brought in guild members to actually pair with the participants. Uh, that turned out to be a huge waste of time. <laughs> it would take anywhere from 10 minutes at the outset to an hour just to get the, the right pairings done, which is just a stupid problem to have. So we predetermined the pairings, right? We just took a list of mentors, took a list of participants, and just randomized tuples out of them, right? So that actually solved a very, very silly but, but crucial problem that we had running this course. And finally, uh, it turns out that the choice of what project the participants are building has a huge impact on the effectiveness of the course. So the project that we, that we picked ended up having a lot of incidental complexity that had nothing to do with either Wix, the tech stack that we used. It was just we picked something that, that by, by complete accident had, uh, you know, had people waiting a couple days just figuring out how to do multi-part, multi-file uploads over the web. Seems like a stupid problem to have, and it is, right? But that's just a, 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 you know, an artifact of the project that we ended up picking. So this is, this is a, a, a pretty critical point, and uh, we ended up, we ended up uh, designing, or at least we're in the process of designing a new project that makes more sense and is more flexible uh, and also gives uh, teams that are actually more advanced than other teams within the same course a lot of leeway, like a lot of extra credit, a lot of stuff that can be tacked onto the project on the fly uh, just to expand or reduce its scope.
lessons learned, right? The big lessons, and this is what I'm going to wrap up in, uh, wrap up with. And obviously, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So, if you're going to go with any sort of major onboarding program, one thing that you need to realize is that mentors are your biggest asset, right? If you're uh, doing through, uh, if you're doing a course like we did, and you're building projects, mentors are the ones who help you track the team progress, right? They give you the best visibility into what is actually going on with your participants in the onboarding program. They help participants overcome obstacles and they teach a lot. Like even if you have all of the lectures in place, people are gonna need help coming to grips with either basic or advanced concepts that they didn't quite get from the lectures or the workshops or whatever, right? Mentors tend to pair with, uh, with participants on whatever onboarding program you're running, they give probably the most benefit. They need structure in order for that benefit to come to bear, right? But mentors give the most benefit in terms of onboarding out of anything that you will ever do. So in other words, you need to treat them with respect, right? You need to be very inclusive. Uh, you need to make sure that they have the right tools and the right structure they need to have a lot of say in how you uh, structure things, uh, what you actually do, your choice of course, all your choice of project, all of these things are critical. So meet with them and listen to them. Make sure that they uh, get to voice their concerns and also follow up on these concerns. And this is probably the most critical bit. The first iteration of the crash course that we did, we failed to really listen to our mentors and we lost a lot of kind of internal street cred within Wix. The second iteration round, we actually realized that and started working extremely closely with our various mentors and our various support staff and our lecturers from within the company. Uh, and that actually had very, very, very positive results, both in terms of the effectiveness of the onboarding program and the willingness of people from the, the, general, uh, um, the general company, like the general R&D organization to actually participate in onboarding new engineers. So this is critical. Second, running a course is a big project and it's costly, right? You have pretty massive ramp up. Like if you're doing this from scratch, you're gonna end up spending one to three months designing and implementing the course, right? If you have lectures on your internal tools, someone needs to develop them, right? They may need help. They may need, they may be tremendous experts in doing continuous delivery and building uh, you know, release pipelines, but they're probably not extremely experienced speakers, so you need to help them out with that. You, know, you need to either offer them for someone else to take over and they'll, they'll just be consulting on the content, or you need to run them through a gamut of you know, how to do content development, how to produce a proper presentation, you know, how to do public speaking. We actually ended up having a public speaking workshop for the people involved in this because that was what was necessary in order to guarantee that things actually do work properly. Uh, so there's a, a very high cost in setting this up for the first time. But there's also a pretty high cost actually running this course. Like you've set everything up, you have everything documented, it's beautiful. You run through an iteration every two months. So as it turns out, it takes about a week to set this up and typically you don't get the same set of people, the same set of mentors, the same lecturers, the same staff on every iteration, so you need to prepare them, right? And that can take up to three days, just going over the project details and hashing out the, the communication structure and the, the mutual expectations, that takes time and effort and resources. And the course itself obviously is three weeks, right? So you're paying however many engineers uh, are running through the course for three weeks, to not produce any value, right? So that's something that you need to at least be aware of uh, right off the bat. Uh, you also need the right staff in place. So in our case, we had three full-time staff members um, just doing this and nothing else at all for the, for the ramp up and for every iteration. We had a, a program manager uh, that at least for the previous iteration was me. We had a project manager um, who's responsible for tying up loose ends and documenting everything, making sure nothing falls between the cracks because this is a massive scheduling effort, right? You have, uh, in our case, we had one mentor for every participant. So that's 12 people for 12 participants. We had uh, 
something around 20 lecturers coming in to actually give lectures about internal tools. Um, we had any number of things going on. We had uh, people who couldn't make their lecture because they were sick or because they're, they're, you know, they had to take care of the kids or all the stuff that happens day to day uh, for any software company. So just coordinating all that effort is actually a lot of work. So we've found that having a full-time project manager on this is actually crucial. Uh, and also, at least for the ramp up, but also typically for iterating over material, you will need someone who's a professional training developer or can act in that capacity. Someone to uh, walk the prospective lecturers through the process of you know, generating PowerPoint presentations and actually telling a cohesive story Right, if you have someone coming in telling, uh, telling people about the build pipeline, they need to have the right set of, you know, the, the right mindset to actually do that properly. Uh, so that's also a very, a very critical role uh, in this stuff. Um, and with that, I'm pretty much done. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. And before you do, we're hiring in Vilnius. So if any of this excites you and you want to be part of it or you want to undergo that program, uh, just get in touch. Well, there's a booth right outside. Uh, any questions? Yes. What's been our return on investment? It's very hard to say. I can tell you in terms of uh, the, the amount of time that it took, uh, just how much it cost us. Well, I couldn't tell you in numbers, right? But, uh, you know, I, could, I have the data. With regards to what is the return, it's a lot harder to quantify. We need to run through you know, a certain number of iterations before we have even an idea of what sort of benefit is accrued. We've tried to get the initial data in terms of how much time is, is currently spent, like before we started the program, uh, how much time is actually spent onboarding new engineers. But as it turns out, it's also practically impossible to quantify. So to begin with, until we actually have kind of the, the organizational instrumentation, if you will, in place to gather those metrics. Uh, right now, we have to uh, rely on basically instinct, uh, the people that we interview and the people going through the process and just a general gut feel of whether or not it, it had been worth it. Uh, the, the, general, uh, the general perspective is that this was a very, very successful uh, program for us. Um, but we have a, we're still tweaking it because we haven't figured out like the scheduling thing, the fact that it's pre-scheduled, it loses efficiency after two to three months. If you have someone in your organization for more than three months, the, they'll know all they need to know at that point, and there's very low value in, in uh, running them through this uh, through this grinder. So um, the the scheduling thing is a big issue for us. Uh, we have not been able to consistently guarantee the number of people required for this to make sense every two months. So we're still trying to figure out what the, what the right technique, I guess you could say, the right scheduling uh, algorithm is for this thing. Yes? So the question is, what was the project scope? It was actually pretty, uh, pretty uh, limited, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't really explain in detail because it has a lot to do with how it integrates to the rest of the Wix ecosystem. So I'd have to give you an hour talk just to, you know, just to answer that question properly. Uh, but let's put it this way. It was, we either by mistake or by careful design, take your pick, ended up with a project that was actually scoped to exactly the amount of time that was available for it. So everyone, you know, every, uh, every team completed the project to its, its uh, satisfaction. One or two teams managed to go beyond that and one team almost got to that point. So it, it turned out to be properly scoped for the amount of time that we had. Anyone else? Yes. So the question was how, um, you know, how much has improved? How, how are, you know, how fast do people uh, kind of get comfortable with deploying to production on their actual teams uh, as opposed to before. So same question, it's very hard to quantify. We have to rely on gut feeling because we're still collecting the numbers, but it seems to be working pretty well. Certainly people are a lot more comfortable getting to that point as they join their team. Whether or not it's actually been uh, successful in terms of reducing the amount of time, 
well, to begin with, that wasn't as big a design goal as the rest of it. The idea was to minim minimize disruptions to the teams. In that respect, it was wildly su successful. Whether or not the time to kind of time to market for a new hire had been reduced, it's too early to tell. Ask me again in six to 12 months. Uh, there was someone in the back, I think. Yes. Okay, so the question was, uh, did we have any, uh, any kind of senior level hires coming into the program? And did we have any, any you know, different kind of pipeline for them? The answer was, we had at least two team leads running through this program. And uh, no, we did not do anything special for them because it, it doesn't really matter. To be an effective team lead at any organization, certainly at Wix, you need to know what is going on at Wix and how things are, are done at Wix. You need to understand, uh, certainly for a, for a not particularly senior, right? Not a necessarily a group lead, but a team, uh, team lead or technical lead position, you certainly need to know the tech stack. You certainly need to know the ecosystem, the tools, uh, the deployment pipeline, all of these things are, are at least as critical for a team lead as for a kind of everyday developer. Uh, so we don't, yeah, we don't have any, any kind of specific uh, pipeline for management or, or any such uh, positions or architects or whatever. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please uh, <laughs> put your feedback.